guardi povero You are worthy of it all All the graces Your front you are of me Until you are for me You deserve Yes, you deserve all the glory and all the praise You are worthy of it all You are worthy of everything I am, oh Lord Because I recognize that everything comes from you. From you are from all. You descend. You descend the glory. Oh, you are worthy of it all. Yes, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy.
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Peace. I believe in it. 
I believe in what you are doing. I believe that you are working. Even in the quietness, even in the busyness, you are working, even though I don't see it. But I believe we will see it. I believe in the work that you are doing in them. I believe. I believe in what you're doing. That you do not start something that you do not finish. You are the God, my healer. You are the God that delivers me. You are the Lord, my deliverer. You sent your word. And heal my, my disease. You, you are the Lord, Lord my healer. You are the Lord that healeth me. You are. You sent your word by the You are the Lord, my healer. Yes, how good it is to remember and proclaim it. It tends to fade away sometimes when we're faced in our lives or other lives close to us that are sick and continue sick. Our faith is tested. And yes, we believe, but there's belief and there's belief. And many times it is true, as our brother said, we take that little shortcut and said, yes, we know if your will be done. But many times the strength of that proclamation of his name is forgotten in the face of circumstances. But circumstances are and never will be truth. Truth makes things happen and changes circumstances. And the truth is you are the God that heals. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, deliverance. For he said, I have been sent to deliver, to heal, to open the eyes. I have been sent to deliver, to open the prison doors, And he hasn't stopped doing that. He just changed his address, but not his name. Every prayer, it's not like the letters to Santa that get lost in some box somewhere. No, even though his address changed, Every whisper, every shout, every tear reaches the destination of his powerful, powerful mercy. And his ears hear the faintest cry. Hallelujah. And as that song goes, I believe in miracles. I've seen the soul set free, miraculous, the change in one 
image of a flower pushing up from the darkness of the hole, from the darkness of the dirt thrown on top of that bulb. And I've seen the lily, which is a symbol that we use that flower on Easter, the symbol of life from death healing in sickness. What a picture. From the darkness, from the impossible, from the whole, covered up with impossibilities. Resurrection, life, breaks through the stubbornness of reality, of life, of naysayers, of doctors' opinions, through the sod, through the hardness, the impossibility, it breaks through pure white, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I've seen the lily push its way up through the stubborn sod. I believe in miracles, for I believe in God. Hallelujah. That's why we speak the name of Jesus and should never cease. And the hardest of times in the darkest of times. We are just a step away from the supernatural. A step away from the answer. I want to speak about how we can tap in to that supernatural power and why it's so hard to and what is so close to us and yet, sometimes so far, as the soldiers standing by the cross were so close and yet so far away from what was happening, from the truth, from the reality, the power of his death and soon resurrection. And I'm going to use what might seem to be a scripture out of context but you'll see it's not in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9 the writer says there remains therefore a rest to the people of God Let us labor, verse 11 of Hebrews 4, therefore to enter into that rest. Labor, strive to enter into that rest. The more we strive to achieve things and struggle with things in our life, the further we are from rest. It is faith that gives us rest, and doubt and in belief gives us stress, because we cannot handle, we cannot achieve what needs to be achieved. We're always seeking in our own selves 
seeking answers in a world full of questions. Solutions in a world full of problems. Ways of achieving in a world full of challenges that we must overcome. Decisions that must be made. Some decisions that will affect perhaps the rest of our lives or at least a good many years of our lives. Decisions we must, must make. Roads that we must take. And we struggle trying to force our brain like we would do in school before an exam, <clears throat> cramming the answers, hoping that we'll be able to pass when the test comes. We try to force ourselves to find an answer to a problem, to reach a decision based on facts, to find a solution. We even consult, especially the young people, the pe your peers, others, your family, for help and knowing the way that you should go, the solution to your problem, the decision you should make. In my life, uh, I remember in times past, I was so pushed in from many directions to have to make decisions for many people in the place that God had placed me, trying to find the answers of natural things, of spiritual things, of counsel to give. And I would so push myself and my brain to try to find the scriptures, to try to find the answers, to be able to give the correct counsel, to be able to find even answers for daily problems that I was faced with. And I remember sometimes I just stopped trying and said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave that for tomorrow. I'm going to even stop and see if I can just rest a little bit. And suddenly as I was waking up, the answer was there. I didn't dream it. My mind wasn't thinking about that. And suddenly, there the answer was. Mysteriously appearing there in, in that fog between being asleep and being awake before the mind grabbed traction and began to steer me where the problems would lead me. Inventions would come to my mind. In fact, I would... I would keep a little notepad and a pen or pencil by my bed. So when I woke up suddenly with that idea of what to do or the solution to get up and quickly write it down, lest I forget. You would think your mind as it woke up, it would remember, but the contrary, that thought wasn't part of something my mind could process. It came from somewhere else in my, and my brain couldn't grasp it. I had to write it down and enforce it. Hey, look, look, look. Mystery. When I stopped trying and surrendered to sleep, surrendered my control, the control of my own mind, my will, my knowledge. Where did that thought come from? Why, when I let go and stopped trying, did it suddenly happen? Harvard University did a study and concluded to this obvious 
thing. They concluded, we solve our problems while we're asleep. They don't know how, they don't know why. They think maybe your mind keeps working. But is it just our physical brain working as we dream? Or is there a deeper mystery involved? And I want to speak about this mystery. This rest is available to us, as I just read, there remains a rest to the people of God. For he that's entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. And as we let go, we said, stop. I'm not gonna keep pushing myself. I want, I want my answer to come from that place. I don't know where it is or what it is, but it's certainly not from my brain. And verse 10 of Hebrews 4 says, For he that enters into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. And verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 4 says, And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So God worked, 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 and then he rested. God ceased working. But do we rest? We know the Jews stop working on Saturday and have a day of being able to do other things or just think or read. But is not working or taking a day off, is that, is that the rest that will find that supernatural so near to us? Or is there yet a deeper mystery here? They teach the children about the creation of man that we begin somehow and started off as cavemen. Grunting. Killing some animals by mistake and then continuing to do the same thing and little by little we evolve to have a little bit of intelligence. And yet, we find in chapter 2 of Genesis, God creating man in his image. And chapter 2, verse 7, it said, God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Some said, but look, The carbon dating says that this bone is millions of years old along with the dinosaurs. I don't know. Maybe the dust was a caveman he breathed into. All do I know is that that caveman could never be what Adam was. Adam was in God's image. God is spirit and God breathed into him and suddenly something happened and it says he became a living soul. Adam was not a caveman. He was extremely endowed with ability. One moment he was a body made of dust. And the next, he's a fully formed, functioning, and highly intelligent being when God's breath of life made him a living soul. Check this out. Genesis 2, 15, and the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden, Eden to dress it and keep it. What? All different species of plants, of flowers, of fruit. How would he know? This next week, I, I have to do some pruning. in my little tiny vineyard. How does he know? How did he know? Here God said, here is your garden, my garden. Take care of it, dress it. This one you prune, this one don't touch it. This one has a seed, this doesn't. This one you have to cut a twig, the other you don't. How, do you, how does he know how to take care of that garden? 
And then it says, verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. That several, several thousands, tens of thousands, a hundred thousand maybe, different fowls and animals. And it said, God brought them, verse 19, to Adam and said, what do you want to name this little red bird? Yeah, that's what it says. Brought them all to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name from there on. Yes, a caveman. Grunt. Grunt, grunt. I don't think so. I don't think so. And verse 20, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. Yes. How could that man, with only hours of existence, have that capacity? And the animals he came to name didn't. Why? Because God did not breathe into the nostrils of the animals. Thus they didn't have what Adam had. He became a living soul. Yes, we're very conscious of our body. We see ourselves in mirrors, but our soul our spirit. That's where the supernatural is born and comes from. Thus Adam's great capacity and ability came from the breath of God. For God is spirit. And yet, he had not yet acquired the knowledge that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will give unto him. No, he didn't have the encyclopedia, the knowledge that the tree gave. No, but he had great ability, capacity. Another mystery is God's power over human body. There we read in the same chapter 2, the first medical operation. God. Verse 21, the first use of anesthesia. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he took out one of his ribs. And then closed up the flesh. That's why they say, I haven't counted it, but they say we have one less rib than women. I, I don't know. I'm not going to take the time now, but you can do that later if you want. And the rib which the Lord God has taken from man, he made a woman. Now, explain that to me. If that's not supernatural, from one piece of bone, he made another human being, a woman. I don't know, but for some reason he said, whoa, man. He created the women and some said, then God left. He went to rest and you take care of it. Whoa, man. Medical science that has been like cavemen's understanding for centuries and millennia about how the human body works. Medical science is just beginning to understand the function of the brain. Their knowledge and understanding how the brain works has changed so much that a textbook 
medical textbook from 10 years ago is totally wrong and discarded. Because they discover, no, no, that was wrong. It wasn't that way. It's because of this. How our thoughts are born, how the brain cells communicate with one another by chemicals. That like in a little electric spark connect the cells in our brain through what's called synaptic connections. That control our thoughts, directs our body, but who's driving? Who is doing that inside? I'm not doing it. It's happening as I speak. Ideas come and says something snaps inside. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Who's driving my brain? Yes, it's all what? Sparks that come back and, and forth randomly? Come on, man. Who's driving? Or is it something else? Behind the brain, is there a soul that's in charge or a spirit that's in charge? Or is it our brain? Somehow autonomous, AI, a pre-Tesla invention, drives itself. Because when we die, they can keep our brain with oxygen and blood going through it, and yet it does not think, it cannot communicate, it can't move the tongue, it can't control the body. So, hey, that's not the driver. It loses complete control. And then, when the brain synapses, connections stop. And there's no more brain waves. And the doctors say, he's gone. She's gone. So the brain is totally silent now. And yet, suddenly after a while, they come back again and begin to describe what they saw, what they heard, what the doctor did, who walked in. It happened just recently. How on earth if the brain wasn't working? There was no more waves on the screen, no brain activity. In that rest of the brain, when the brain is totally stopped, people see, they hear, they think, they feel things, even things that aren't part of this world. They see angels, they see their family members coming. And then many come back again. There's many people that come back again in the morgue that they awaken and tell these things. And it's happened throughout history. That's why they've held wakes. Well, they said, no, you can't bury them yet because people come back. What is the mind then? What is that other eye that sees, that other ear that hears? That eye that's able to see into another dimension, beings from heaven and some from hell. Yes, we give too much credit to this little piece of jello in our skull. We think that it controls, and it does, controls our body, what they do, what our members do, where they go, what our hands do, where our eyes turn to, what we speak, how to say it. And if we begin to slur a little bit of our words, say, wait a minute, something's wrong with his brain. He's beginning to slur. That was intentional. Don't get scared. 
tells us what to listen to, what to speak, what to think. In fact, our brain though, just so you know where it comes from, it seems very biased against God. In fact, the scripture says that our brain is in enmity, our mind is in continual enmity against God, hates God. So your brain won't help you draw near to Jesus, believe me. You have to pray against it. It'll obstruct you with doubts every step of the way. You have to push against it. When you read your Bible, when you pray, when you come to church, you have to push against your own self which is your, or your brain inside. Just recently, I read in the news just, just a couple of weeks ago of a person that went in and killed many others and what, what she wrote was very interesting. Forgive me, God. Your Holy Spirit was shouting at me so many times, but I just didn't want to listen. Yet it's written, that's what she said. And then finally I gave over to the other voice, to Satan, and he led me to do what I did. Yes, I believe that's true. I believe that there were voices inside that were shouting how many times have we been doing something that we shouldn't do and, and something inside shouts at us, our conscious, as they call it, I don't know. And then the other part says, do it. And the other guy on the, this side of the sh shoulder says, no. Our bodies are a marvel of God's creation. It works automatically. We don't have to think about whether our heart is pumping or not. I just assume it is because I'm still standing. We don't need to think about controlling our liver. We just give it food and water and then let it do what it does. It's just automatic. Our brain is a mystery. Our brain is like a locked safe full of treasures, but we don't have the key or the combination. Our brain only works processing the little part that we have access to in our memories and our upbringing and whatever. But there's another vault hidden inside of us. I don't know if it's in our brain or where it is, but there's another thing inside of us perhaps within our spirit and our soul, a treasure trove of power, of wisdom, of abilities, of counsel, a mystery, like Paul said, that dwells within us, within our soul and our spirit, so intertwined to our brain that sometimes it communicates through. A mystery that experts do not understand, but they've named it. They gave it a name. They call it the savant syndrome. Uh, we were watching yesterday uh, the World Cup uh, game of Argentina against Mexico, okay? And uh, they both wanted to win, of course. And uh, we watched as the players got excited and started pushing and shoving and even kicking. I saw, we saw a guy that was actually kicked in the head by a Mexican, yes, but the other team did it too. He was kicked in the head. I said, oh no, he's gonna go into a coma, concussion. He just fell like the floor, the referee, beep yellow card and I said poor guy on the 24th of September of 2016 during the soccer game 
a 16-year-old kid playing as a goalkeeper. His name was Ruben Semoff from the Brookwood High School, very close to us here in Snellville, Georgia. And as he was playing, he dove for a ball somebody had kicked, and another teenager accidentally kicked Reuben near his right temple. He fell with a severe concussion. And that kick put Reuben into coma for three days. And when Ruben finally awoke in the hospital, he shocked his family member, members and doctors when he opened his eyes and began speaking fluently in Spanish, a language he did not know because he could only speak English. Fluently before his head injury. And he could not speak or understand English. He seemed to have forgotten it. And as slowly he began to remember how to speak English, he would forget to speak the Spanish until it completely faded from his mind. What's that? How can that be? In April 2010, a Croatian girl awoke, awake, awoke from a brief coma speaking in fluent German to the surprise of his mother of her mother and the doctors. An 18-year-old Czech Speedway driver named Matej Gus. In 2007, he was knocked out during a car crash. After a brief coma, he awoke speaking perfect English to his ambulance technicians in a British accent. Yes, they've named that. It's called foreign language syndrome. What is it? We don't know. How does it happen? We don't know. How can they speak fluent? We don't know, but we know what the name is. And it can occur when a person becomes unconscious due to a brain injury. So something knocks that brain out of commission. Says, get out of here and something else happens. Harvard University, University did a study and concluded that these head injuries happened, when it happens, the brain loses control and attempts to reboot itself. How do you know? I don't know, it's just speculation. It begins to reboot like a computer. It was damaged and it tries to start up again, repairing that damage. And there's a moment there when the brain is, is, is locked up in darkness and cannot wake up that the miracle happens. The person speaks a language they couldn't speak before or they develop remarkable musical or artistic abilities in 2002, two men savagely attacked Jason Paget outside of a karaoke bar, leaving him with a severe concussion and post-traumatic stress disorder. But when he came to, it turned Paget into a mathematical genius who sees the world through the lens of geomet geometry. A genius. Why do we go to school? Somebody just hit me over the head. 400 years ago, if this would have happened, and the person survived this head injury and these things began to happen, though they would be burnt to the stake as a witch. And they've done that. In emergencies, you've read about it. 
weak people, normal people are suddenly endured with the power of Samson and can lift a wall or a car and free a person that's trapped underneath. And then later they can't even lift a pencil. What's that? Where does that come from? Where did Samson's power come from? That he could do what he did. My father told us when he was a child in camp meetings, lying on the floor in the sawdust, playing with the sawdust. Some people were on the floor, others went to the power, others were singing, others were dancing. Because there were so many people there, a young lady got on the wooden bench on top of him and began to dance. And he saw as she, with her eyes closed, danced all the way to the end of, the, of that bench and kept on dancing in the air. He saw that. And yes, I heard that story many times. But I don't know if I can say I believed it until I saw people levitating and flying almost through the air. And I said, oh my God, where does this come from? The brain? No. The body? No. In other words, when our brains lose control, control is lost, something else steps in, can step in, take control. Hebrews 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerning of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It wasn't necessarily re referring to the Bible because the New Testament hasn't even been put together or, or even written. The word of God is what God speaks. That's what he's referring to. God is speaking. The word krik in Greek is zao, living. What he's saying is when God speaks, it's alive. It's something that's living. It's not dead. It's not inert. It's not powerless. It's living. It's powerful, energetic, active, mighty. There's another mystery. It's not necessary to have your head kicked in or to go into a coma, coma to be a savant or to have the foreign language syndrome. Just read what happened in Pentecost. 120 people were filled with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 4, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we read that they spoke in 15 languages because there was people and they named the countries they were from and they said, we heard in our own language, you glorifying God. So when our mind steps aside and we allow the Spirit to move us, and that foreign language syndrome begins to work. And we utter things we know nothing about. A foreign language. Of course it is a foreign language. What are we saying? Sometimes we don't know. Other times we do. Because the Spirit gives the interpretation. My wife tells about the children's camp. She was at in Argentina, where a young boy began speaking in perfect French. And there happened to be a visitor that knew to speak French. Another occasion, it was Hebrew. It was recorded and taken to the university and they said he's glorifying God. Anyway, they asked the Frenchman what he was saying, and he was glorifying God in perfect French. 
And then because it was time for lunch and a lot of kids were, were leaving to, to eat, my wife said to the Frenchman, ask him in French if he's hungry. And he did, and he answered in perfect French, I'm hungry for grace. I'm hungry for grace. And my wife noticed that this Frenchman that was visiting spoke one way with his mouth and, and the kid spoke like a more closed word of French. And my wife asked the Frenchman if the kid was speaking with an accent. He said, oh, no, no, no. It's perfect French. It's a French that, that the, the French speak that are in the border, I think, with Belgium. And then later, his mom says, that's where our ancestors are from, from the border between France and Belgium. So not only did he speak a language he didn't know, but he spoke what was in his DNA. Yes, give it a name, foreign language syndrome. But tell me where it comes from. It didn't come from their brain, and yet their brain moved their tongue. So something that's not natural, that's supernatural, that's so close to us, that's available to us, with something as simple as a kick to your head. But is it necessary? No. Because if you can just stop and let God speak, if you just stop, and let, let his spirit, that word of God speaking that's alive and is powerful and can look right through to the very intense, not only in your brain of your thoughts, but the intents of your heart. And like a two-edged sword, it can divide what man cannot divide, doesn't even know where it is, the spirit and the soul. Now, not only has that happened with humans, but that's happened at least once that we know of when an angel stood on the path where the prophet Balaam was going to go and curse the Jews, Israel, and the donkey started talking in Hebrew. And Balaam had not knocked him on the head, nor did he have a concussion. The donkey spoke in tongues. I don't think he knew what he was saying. Another mystery. Where does that come that the prophets see into the future? Where does that come that Daniel could see what the end of the world was? Where does that come from that Ezekiel th saw things that looked like metal birds uh, vomiting fire out of their beaks to save Israel? Of course, now we say, well, that's an F-15. That's a warthog, man. Yeah, they see those missiles, those things, those fire things that come under their wings that look to look like look to come out of their mouth. That's a missile. But how, how could he see that? There is a world that our spirit is linked to, that is eternal, that is God, that is spirit, that is powerful, that's supernatural. If we could just make our stupid, stupid, I'm sorry for my French, our stupid, stupid brains, born in sin, doubting every moment of our existence that God even exists. Although all things prove that he does. And this world keeps feeding that brain with doubts 
keeps feeding that brain with God not existing, keeps feeding that brain of the little babies. Yes, our brain is our enemy. Yes, it helps us get up in the morning and brush our teeth. But that's about all we should trust it with. We should only trust in God. Trust in that voice inside of us that if we'd pay attention, it would be a shout and our brain would be a whine. If we would just say, help me, Lord. And from your spirit, from inside will flow living waters as Jesus promised. How can it be that people's bodies change mysteriously from sick to healthy, incurable diseases, heal like in the times of Jesus? I've seen so many miracles with my own eyes. to real and yet our mind will continually try to doubt cast shadows so that we don't connect to that treasure chest that's within us that is Christ in us the hope the strength the power the wisdom the counsel the comfort everything our brain cannot give us because our brain will never give us hope. It'll always jump to the extremes. I'm gonna die. Yes, Jesus did so many miracles and hasn't stopped doing it even though he changed his address. Could it be that when we can enter into that place, without our brains being annulled by a kick to the temple or an accident? Could it be possible to let go and enter in the midst of turmoil to a place where there's rest? I tell you there is because I've managed to do it. In the midst of the greatest of troubles. And without yoga, without Zen, without hum, 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 it's just, it's just right there. It's right there for the taking, right there for the entering. But you have to, you have to tell this brain of ours. Shut up. I don't trust you. You've never helped me. Just do your job and keeping my body going. I'll trust you to do that. But everything else, I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to listen to you. I want to listen to the creator. The God. That's alive whose word is quickening, powerful. Yes, it is possible. All we have to do is stop striving and surrender. Surrender to God and his will. And then we'll begin to hear and that soft voice will become a shout the more you pay attention to it, the clearer it will become so that we can hear our Creator speak into our spirit, hear His answers, hear His directions, hear His solutions, receive His inspiration, receive healings, receive His miracles. So. Again, to where I started, there remains a rest.
for the people of God. Let us labor thereof to enter into that rest. That word, word labor is podazzo, which means make haste and exert yourself, make an effort, endeavor, give diligently to enter into that place of rest that we might have rest and let go and let God. And if you can't, go to a horse stable and stand behind him. Approach him from behind. And maybe you'll either die or start speaking French. No, I really do not recommend that. There's a song I'd like to finish with. And that is a promise of Jesus. That precious name, that's the link between earth and heaven. Jesus is the door to the supernatural. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the only connection we can ever have because there's no one else that can stand between us and God. No, no other intercessor. It's Jesus. We can lay hold on him to calm our fears. To stoke our faith till it becomes from ashes into a fire within us. Until we're no longer a smoking flask, but a burning fire of faith. Jesus said, take my yoke and I will give you rest. In a world full of turmoil, in a world crying out almost every second, shouting to us, pay attention to me. Look at what's happening. Look what's bad. Look how terrible. Oh, if we could turn off our carnal minds as simply as turning off the phone. Just go into that place that where we go at night, that's why many times we awake and we're singing a song, a hymn. Where have we been? Why are we singing that? Because there is just a breath away our home. Our spirit and our soul cries out to the living God. As the deer pants after the water, my soul longs after thee, and my brain gets in the way, distracts me, discourages me. Oh, who will deliver me from myself? Strive to enter into that place as often as you can and let your brain be reset again because our brain our will can direct it you know we start thinking of something say, oh you want me to think oh yeah that's interesting it starts going down a different road so if you just work this is the place I want to be. 
This is what I want to hear. This is what I want to read. I want you, Jesus. Suddenly our, our mind shouts. We'll become quieter and quieter. And his truth will become stronger and stronger. I will give you rest, Jesus said. I will give you rest. Only take my yoke upon you. And I will give you rest. In another time, Jesus said, take up my cross. Take up your cross. Don't try to run away. Just take it. Take it where? To Jesus. And I will give you rest. Because my yoke is easy, he said. It's not heavy. The world's yoke is heavy. Fear is heavy. Discouragement is heavy. But his yoke is light. I will give you rest. Yes, I will give you rest. Just take my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest. Holy Spirit, help me in my weakness. To stand when I fall. When I'm weary. To lay hold of your strength. When I'm sad. To take hold of your comfort. Jesus. There's so much that you have for us. Riches and glory and we live in poverty. Engaged by the heavy loads and burdens this world places upon us. And there is a place of quiet rest near to your heart, O oh God. Teach me, help me, inspire me to remember who I am and who you are. That I am not a prisoner I am more than conqueror. That within my grasp is all the power of heaven. At my disposal. Because you said nothing is impossible. If you could just believe Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, strengthen my unbelief. Quieten the sounds of my evil nature that I might hear the sounds of heaven. And I will
as you have promised. Renew this mind. Fill my heart, my spirit, my soul with the sounds of heaven. So I can hear the sounds of heaven. Like the sounds of many waters, I want to hear the sounds of heaven. Like the sound. a river of living waters draw me draw us and we will draw near unto you and the things They will grow strange, leading in the light of your glory and grace. I want to hear the sound of heaven I want to think the thoughts of heaven like the sounds of the waters that are living so be it so be it. Because nothing is beyond your power. You can change. You can open that door where you stand knocking day and night. Help me open the door so you can come and dwell as you promised. And as Mary, I can sit at your feet for my mind, like Martha, tries to do things that need to be done. But inside, Lord, let my Mary be awake. Let my spirit be alive. Let the ears of my understanding be opened. The eyes that even though my Martha is working, worried, on things that mean nothing eternal. That my spirit and my soul can be as John resting on your bosom, leaning on your love. Hallelujah. 
Halleluja. Halleluja. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord have mercy on you. And may the Lord grant you rest.